Hey everyone, welcome to the Paw Awareness Podcast and thanks for joining me. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, and YouTube. And also check us out at pawawareness.org and on Instagram at pawawareness underscore official. On Instagram, we are doing submissions for Pet of the Week where you can submit your foster pet and we'll pick one winner every month and we'll give $200 to their choice of charity or foster. Thanks for watching and I hope you enjoy this episode. Hey everyone, welcome to today's episode. Today I have Emily Jackson, the Philanthropy Director of Companion Animal Alliance of Baton Rouge. And thank you so much for coming on and introduce yourself as well as the organization. Thank you for for having me and for um, allowing me to talk a little bit about our shelter here in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. We are an open intake shelter, which I'm sure many uh, in your audience are familiar with. We don't turn a single animal away, despite their age, breed, condition, their health. We take all of them in. And we have been um, operating since 2011. We started in 2010 and took over from animal control in our area in 2011. We strive to increase the save rate of animals in our region by spay and neuter, by providing the best veterinary care, finding forever homes for these pets. And that could be through our foster networks, our transport partners, and doing our best to return lost pets to their families. We take in approximately 8,000 to 9,000 animals every year, so pretty high intake. And we've just increased our save rate to 86% from when we took over um, in 2011, it was around 20%. So, So a big increase in the past 10 years. And I mean, that's amazing that you guys are not only not turning any animal down, but your save rate is so high. So clearly you guys are doing something that I feel like a lot of organizations need to take a look at. What are some things that you implement? Uh, it, you know, whether it be a vast network or, you know, a constantly networking or some things you guys are doing internally, what, how do you keep that save rate so high yet not turn any animal down? Yeah, I mean, that's the, the big question, right? We we shifted to a foster-centric model in 2020, and that was something where we started to see major shifts in the save rate. And what I mean by that is we've got a pretty large foster network, um, but we once we knew that COVID was going to be around for a while, we knew that we needed to get as many pets out of the shelter as possible in the event that um, owners pass away or, I mean, all the unknowns, right, at the beginning. Um, So within 24 hours, we got out almost 150 pets into foster care just by reaching out to the public. We did an emergency foster orientation um, to where if you had never fostered a pet before, there was really no reason for you to to feel like you weren't welcome or that you had to have this crazy amount of experience. We put all of our resources on a website. We said, look it over, show up at the shelter within 24 hours, let's get these pets out. And that was extremely successful. The community stepped up and it was really inspiring. Um, So I'd say number one, creating a foster centric model that has been has been extremely helpful with the save rate. The other thing is, um, you know, we have a three step determination process in the event that we have to euthanize an animal. And we've been able to decrease that number because of our extracurricular, I guess you can call it our enrichment activities that we provide the animals. So within the past year, maybe two years, we have transformed the pet stay at our shelter. So previously it was what most shelters are familiar with. The animal arrives, it goes through a series of of vet care and hopefully gets moved through to go towards adoption. And then they sit and they wait and they hope and pray to find their forever home. We decided after paying close attention to um, other shelters who were realizing 
that they needed to make the most of the pet stay in order to, to have a higher chance of them getting adopted and a higher chance of them being adopted more quickly, we decided to mimic that. And we've launched an enrichment program that includes playing jazz music for the cats and dogs several times throughout the day. It includes playing audiobooks, Disney audiobooks um, in the afternoon for them as something kind of different to hear. They receive a different aroma. So maybe it's a little bit of a coconut spray uh, right in front of their kennel that excites them and, and feels like an activity. Um, they're given frozen chicken stock and peanut butter and, and Kongs. And all of that um, is in hopes, and we think that it's, it's proven, was in hopes of increasing adoption, that these pets anxiety was was decreased that we would that we would increase their ability to um to be approachable and and we think that that's worked i mean the save rate is is showing that that's really interesting i've never um heard of an organization doing that but it makes sense though right like it it stimulates their brain as opposed to just you know, keeping them locked in a cage, which in turn, like you said, I, you know, increases their adoptability. And are you always reevaluating things? Like what's the goal here? Like 86% save rate, right? I mean, is that why like, are you just like nonstop till you get to a hundred? Like, is that the goal? Or, I mean, do you focus your resources on other things because you are balancing so many other animals? Like how do you allocate your resources and what are your goals with that? So our, our goal is obviously to, to have the highest possible save rate. I, I'd imagine anyone in this sector would say the same thing. However, because of the nature of our organization being an open intake um, and partnering with an animal control, it, it would be impossible to hit 100%. And that's, that's just the way it is, unfortunately. But um, getting as close as 100 as we can is always going to be the goal. We know that COVID had a little bit to do with the excitement of bringing a pet home while people were working from home. Um, so we're paying close attention to the data around how many pets went into foster care versus were at the shelter and how did that impact save rate overall. Um, were people adopting more in 2020 because they had the time to take care of a, a puppy or a new pet versus any other normal year? We're paying close attention to that. But like I mentioned before, it is, it is clear to us that it, while it was an extraordinary year, we still have these systems in place and hopes that regardless of what's going on, we can still continue to increase that save rate. Um, I hope, I hope that answers your question a little bit. Yeah, it definitely does. And I know that you mentioned you're working with some outside partners. Are you working with other states then, or is everything kind of like centered in Louisiana? Like who are you working with currently? Sure. So, uh, we started transporting animals a couple of years ago and it's really picked up steam. Um, and by that, I mean, we partner with various, um, other rescues. Some of them are in New Jersey. Um, and, and most of them are in the Northeast. And that is because, unfortunately, Louisiana has um, a high intake challenge. And in other states, which seems wild to our team, they have a shortage of intake. So we are able to provide surplus to them. We can send them cats, dogs, um, whatever they're, they're in need of. And that allows our pets to get adopted more quickly. And that in turn also helps our save rate. We have a variety of local volunteers that assist with the whole transport process, getting them ready for transport, making sure that their medical records are good to go, and then even driving them up north. We also partner with some local um, rescues uh, as well. So there's an organization called Cat Haven in Baton Rouge that will pick up from us once a week and bring to their, their local rescue. And another one that specifically picks up dogs to bring to their adoption house. 
So all of that collectively, we're, we're grateful that it's not just our little engine. We're, we've got quite a network and that makes all the difference. Yeah. And that's really interesting too, because I believe you guys are the first organization I've talked to that kind of in that state of not having the shortage, right? And I've talked with actually a few organizations where they are the ones importing. You probably know better than I do. They mentioned that the they're all importing from the South. I don't like Louisiana, Mississippi, and they maybe might mention a couple of other states. What exactly does that look like on the ground floor, right? Like with the influx of animals and not, you know, is they're like you said, they're a waiting list for anyone listening. I mean, a lot of rescues right now there, if you want to adopt there, you have to go to a wait list and all these other things. But you guys, on the other hand, it's not that way at all. It's just this massive influx of animals. And it's like, okay, how can we save these animals? At, you know, all of them. Right. And so what does that look like? And what are maybe some issues there that are causing that as opposed to other geographical re regions? Because that's kind of what I wanted to ask too, is every region kind of faces their own issues. Absolutely. Um, the number one question we get from people outside of our region or even outside of our state is why do y'all have so many pit bulls? <laughs> the truth is that there is a pit bull breeding challenge in the South. And that impacts the high population that enters our shelter. The added challenge to that is that there's a stigma associated with that particular breed and breeds that are mixed with pit bulls. And, and that then just creates additional an influx of those animals because they're, they're the less wanted. It's so hard to say that because they're, so lovable and the best pets, just like the rest of them. So I would say to that question that there's a bit of a breeding challenge in the South that's causing um, that high influx. And then in particular, it's not like the a breeding of, I don't know, uh, whatever the, the trend or desirable pet is, a golden doodle, for instance, and that we've got 100 golden doodles just waiting to be adopted, which we know would, would fly. I mean, we would have every golden doodle gone out, out of the door within 24 hours. Um, and that's because there's no stigma, right? There's no stigma associated um, with that pet. So that's, that's a little bit of, of the challenge we're seeing. No, that makes total sense. And I know you mentioned having an amazing team of volunteers. How many volunteers currently work at the organization? How big is it and what's that set up like? Yeah, so we um, we have close to 800 active volunteers. Wow. And that doesn't include the foster network, which is closer to about 300. Um, so we're working with an external group of very dedicated animal loving people of around a thousand. And um, I mean, they do everything from walk dogs, provide that enrichment that I mentioned earlier um, to participating in preparing the animals for transports. And then even down to, I mean, right now we've got a, a treat Graham Valentine's day campaign and, you know, they're, they're putting these little cards together to hang on kennels. I mean, that's so cool. <laughs> the volunteers, they don't get enough love or credit, but they are truly the backbone of, of what we're able to do for these pets. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, any organization I talk to, volunteering is so critical. And, you know, especially when it's, you know, we're talking non for profits here and it's just, uh, yeah, an 800. That's, that's amazing. Do you have like training programs for these volunteers or how does that system work? I feel like every organization kind of does things a little different. Um, but what's that look like having so many? As you can imagine, we've revamped and reiterated that training um, as we've adjusted and grown as an organization. Um, but it currently stands that a new interested volunteer attends a one-time orientation at the shelter. And that's led by our programs director. And they're led through safety protocols, how to get a dog in and out of a kennel, how to get a cat in and out of a kennel, best way to walk them on a leash, 
um, what they can eat and what they can't eat. They go through every single detail um, that the volunteer needs to know, how to potentially break up a fight if two dogs get too close. And once they get that basic knowledge, they're then given a full tour of the facility, which is over 30,000 square feet, equipped with a, a retail store and a, a pasture for our horses and chickens and pigs that arrive and a dog park. So they're given the full tour and they're shown everything that they need so that there's not a minute of confusion, because as you can imagine, with that many people coming and going, um, we need to trust that not only are they safe, but they're keeping our pets safe. They're clearly identified. They, they wear um, a lanyard that lets our staff know and the public know that these are volunteers. Um, they're allowed certain permissions because of that. And from there, there's a network of the 800 people that communicate to each other via a private Facebook group. And that's where they're sharing their, their info, their insights, their, their concerns or their questions. Hey, did, did anyone notice Fluffy in kennel number 17? Is the, I think this dog needs some extra love. Does anyone have time say during their lunch break to go do that? And that is that special that, you know, we, we set up this page as just kind of in hopes that that we would be able to share our information and what it's turned into is, is a resource for each other internally. That's great that you guys have. I, I knew there had to be some efficient way to do that, having that many volunteers, because I, I don't think I've spoken with an organization that has a setup like that. Now, I do have a question, like personally, right? So a philanthropy director, can you talk about what it is that you know, like maybe your background, how you fell in love with animals and then what it is that you do? Because I think it's so important for these, especially caught like people going into college or like thinking about their careers and just realizing like, yeah, you can volunteer, but you can also you can do this and make this like your your life passion if you want. And so can you talk a little bit about that, about yourself? Sure. <laughs> My least favorite thing to talk about. <laughs> Great. <laughs> <laughs> I am the philanthropy director. I'm also over all of the organization's communications. And that means I am over all fundraising capacity. So to give you a little background, the shelter um, has a variety of funding and about 40% of the funding comes from individual gifts, individual donors in our community and across the country, really. Um, and I'm in charge of finding those donors, stewarding those donors, thanking those donors. And then it's really, I kind of think of myself in terms of as the role of philanthropy director as a matchmaker. So if someone's listening and isn't familiar with what someone in fundraising does or in philanthropy, I listen to the needs and the interests of someone interested potentially in animal welfare. And then I'm privy to what's going on at the shelter. So I match up what it is that they can give towards and what feels meaningful and impactful for them. That's the majority of, of what I do. If someone says, hey, I've got a dollar or in a lot of cases, a hundred thousand dollars. And how how can I put that to best use? What do you guys need? Where are you, where are your goals? Where are you headed? And then I, I align that. So that's a, a huge part of my role. On the flip side, it's uh, the the more uh, I guess fun the communication side, and that's the social media, our e newsletter that that's put into um, circulation once a month. It's anything like interviews, PSAs, going on the local news to talk about what we're up to and what pets are available. So a lot is encompassed in my role. Um, and to tell you how I got here, I worked in nonprofits prior to working at the shelter and adopted both of my pets from Companion Animal Alliance. And they were transitioning from a previous shelter location. And they knew that with that was going to come great growth. And the brand was going to have to shift to adjust to this, this new world. The new facility was 
rate, it was a $13 million um, capital campaign. So the community was begging for this. They put up their money. They said, this is what's needed. Their, the old shelter was in a bad way and they all were committed to the, to the cause. And at the time um, I was recruited to um, fundraise for, for the, the transition. And um, that's really how, how I got started. And I, I love it. It is I'll tell you the truth. I've never seen anyone work harder than people that love animals. We have a team of animal caretakers that um, are hired through a local partnership with an organization called Louisiana Parole Project. So we hire recently released prisoners that were sentenced to life. And because of um, some changes uh, that, that Congress passed, they've been able to um, get out on parole and we've been able to hire them as animal caretakers. And it is so special and so inspiring to witness for the animal welfare people listening, you know that our job is all about second chances. You could, you could say that top down all day, second chances, second chances. And to witness these employees that we've hired who feel that they've been personally given a life second chance, the compassion and the empathy that they have for these animals. Um, it's that, that right now I can speak to that and say that that's one of the more inspiring parts of, of working with Companion Animal Alliance. It's, it's really special. That is really, really special. And thanks for sharing that because like you said, it, it is all about second chances and, you know, especially some of these animals that are when you are taking in all these animals that may be old or maybe not necessarily the best behaved. And they're just it's just about giving them a second chance. That's the what rescue and shelters do, I think, at their core. So, no, that's fantastic. And I guess what are some things that you to kind of shift gears? What are some things that you guys are working on this year? You know, we just came off of 2020. That was a crazy year for the for rescues and shelters. And going into 2021, what are some goals that you guys are working on, some things that you're excited about, given the state of where we're at currently? I'd say the greatest goal um, is sustainability. So in 2020, we saw um, huge growth and an increase in volunteers, fosters, adopters, and in save rate across the board, just massive growth. And while it's obviously a goal to continue growing, 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 there's a bit of realism here. And, and we, we recognize that in 2021, we've got to, to sustain what it is that we've grown. We want to retain those new volunteers that stepped up in 2020. We want to retain those fosters that stepped up. Another goal um, is reaching our adopters and connecting with our adopters in a way that we've never before. So previously, uh, someone would adopt a pet. We'd say, thanks, good luck, you know, call us if you need us. And we're on to the next pet that needs to be adopted. Um, but we realized in 2020 that not only do these adopters need to be thanked at another point later in, in the year or in a couple of years, um, we wanted them to know that we're still here. And whether it's five years after they adopted, we want them to know that we're a resource. And so in 2021, uh, in about two weeks here, so it'll be February 15th, um, we are launching um, an alumni association for our adopters. And this is just a network for them to connect with each other. It'll be a place for them to feel like they can they can hear from us one-on-one -on -one from our vet team with some great resources and tips on pet care. Um, and of course, it's gonna come with some fun exclusive swag, right? Some alumni t-shirts and, um, and they'll have access to um, some exclusive events at the shelter. We've got already got some fun things planned for our dog park. So fingers crossed that, that COVID runs away and, and we can have all that happen. That's exciting. And I think, yeah, just cultivating a community with those people that have walked through the door. It's so important and awesome that you guys are taking that initiative 
to, you know, cause you never know who wants to, you know, adopt again, or maybe they, they've already adopted, but then they're like, Oh, you know what? Maybe I start fostering now or whatever it may be. And just all that's, that's so cool. I guess I also want to follow up too for maybe any listeners. Do you only work with people in the Louisiana area and all, yeah. How can someone get in touch with you guys if they are listening um, and they want, they are interested in maybe volunteering or adopting or whatever that may be. Sure. Um, so in terms of, of volunteering, we, we, we do only accept local volunteers. Um, if you're out of state and you're inspired by what we're doing and you, you have some service to offer, if that's even just like, Hey, I'd love to help. I don't know with your social media or I've got tips on human resources or accounting. Sure. I mean, we're a nonprofit. So if, if you're inspired by this and you want to help us out, um, you can email me directly and I'd love, I'd love to chat. It's E Jackson at C A A B R dot org. And you can visit our website, uh, which is C A A B R dot org and just browse around. And there's a, a spot for you to send in an inquiry. So if, if you've got a question or just wanted to submit a comment, you can do that there. Perfect. And yeah, whatever medium you're listening on right now, that will be in the description below as well as, you know, social media handles as well. Um, I highly encourage you to check these guys out. And if you are passing through the Louisiana area, Baton Rouge, definitely uh, reach out to them and see if you can stop on by. Yeah. Thank you so much, Emily, for coming on. I thought it was just so great hearing some of your stories. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me.